Could you comment about the efforts that I gather some countries are making to inhibit cash economies? Okay, uh, efforts of some countries to inhibit cash economies. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I, I don't know much about the efforts, but I can make a couple of observations. So I think the efforts um, are, are twofold and oftentimes seemingly contradictory. So one effort, as you note, is that in, in informal economies, uh, the effort is to find uh, abilities to bring cash that's essentially stored proverbially under mattresses into the formal financial institution and help that economy formalize that way. So Robert Newworth's book, uh, Stealth of Nations, talks a lot, for example, about how, how Nigeria is incentivizing banks to create savings and, and checking accounts for entrepreneurs in the informal economy. So there are efforts to provide, in a sense, um, depositors insurance for these accounts for individuals so that banks are more willing to take that risk uh, to, to work with basically cash-based entrepreneurs. So there are those kinds of efforts. And then, of course, there are policy efforts to encourage uh, entrepreneurs in the informal economy to formalize through incorporation, through creating a, 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 a corporate structure that's, that's legally regulated and, and recognized. Uh, the challenge there, you know, Hernando de Soto is a per Peruvian economist who's written quite a bit about this. The challenge is really a regulatory challenge. In so many uh, economies, the rules for setting up a business are so onerous that it's very difficult for small businesses, private entrepreneurs, to formalize their business. And so there's regulatory reform that's trying to make it easier for entrepreneurs to find their way back into the form of economy. The seemingly contradictory uh, policy is that really focuses on the domestic aspect of the economy. But there are lots of informal financial flows that cross national borders, uh, which are really remittances, which is the diaspora or, 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 or fellow countrymen and women who reside overseas send money back to relatives back at home. And oftentimes that follows, uh, that, that's fairly unregulated. Uh, Western Union does huge business in remittances. And developing economies don't want to discourage that. They want those resources to come back home and be spent in their own economy. So while they're, while they're trying to formalize the cash-based economy domestically, they're doing nothing to discourage the, the transnational cash-based economy. This gentleman over here, and then we'll come over here. Yeah, I was wondering, is a, is a trade deficit always bad? In a, and I know in the U.S. we have a large trade deficit. Uh, is that always bad, or is it because you know we we consume maybe more than we export? Is that a, an okay factor, or just explain that to me? It's always bad, except <laughs> it's it's bad for every country in the world except the United States. And the reason for that is that the global economy essentially is a dollar-based economy. So the United States is the only country in the world that effectively can finance its own trade deficit through monetary expansion. So because, because dollars are in such demand globally, because it's viewed as such a safe store of wealth, as you know, the United States can issue treasury bonds. Basically, they can take a loan from consumers around the world to finance its trade deficit. If confidence in the dollar were ever to decline, then our trade imbalance would be a problem. Okay? Now, Paul Krugman, who is a, a sort of a liberal-leaning economist, uh, has said, in fact, the United States could issue many, many more treasuries. That is, the United States could take on even more debt, given how much pent-up demand there is for the dollar. And that makes sense. If you look at the economies of Japan uh, and Western Europe, the euro and the yen are, don't look as safe, like as safe a bet as the United States. So for the United States, it's not really a problem. But for every other economy in the world, it is. Because uh, while you can run short-term trade deficits, uh, you have to finance it either through debt or through economic contraction. That is, slow down your consumption so that consumers, well, there are three options. Exchange rate policy, which is uh, let your currency uh, uh, 
depreciate so that you consume more domestically versus internationally. Um, finance it through a trade deficit. Uh, and uh, you know, those are the short-term options. Or contract the economy, which is discourage consumption by contracting the economy. Governments, needless to say, they don't like to stop economic growth. So that's generally not an option. Governments can only finance it through <coughs> issuance of debt or through uh, exchange rate policy, which is uh, let your currency depreciate so consumption is done domestically rather than internationally. Um, and uh, every other government in the world, that's what they have to do. The United States is the only exception. Uh, I was intrigued by your example of the lady at Tahrir Square uh, and, and Brandon. U.S. economic policy had. Could you connect the dots for us between subsidization of uh, corn for ethanol yeah. and wheat in Egypt? So um, the, the, the question was uh, the example I gave of the protester in Tahrir Square and how U.S. Uh, biofuel subsidies ultimately affected the price of bread in Egypt. So. The National, uh, I think it was the National Research Council commissioned a study on this question in 2008 or 2009. And, and to, to understand their analysis, we have to start with the idea that grains are effectively substitutes for each other. Uh, corn is a substitute for wheat, which is a substitute for rye and other grains. So that if corn gets expensive, I might shift my consumption to wheat or vice versa. So that there, there are substitution effects here. Um, but what happened is there were two simultaneous contractions in the global supply of grains. The Russian uh, failed wheat harvest and the 20 to 30 percent of U.S. corn production that was diverted to biofuels. And so both products appreciated in price simultaneously. Uh, and the, the NRC found that the U.S. US biofuels subsidies was responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of the price appreciation in global grains. That is, had the United States not done that, grains would have been 20 to 30 percent cheaper, bread would have been 20 to 30 percent cheaper. I, I think that's the connection that I was trying to make. Question over there. Good morning. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your time as well for coming out on a nice day like this. Uh, I've actually got two questions. They're kind of related, but not really. Uh, the first one is, can you um, extrapolate an idea like micro lending to the informal economy and then the second the second piece would be you mentioned that the the informal and the illicit economy are taking on ideas that come from the formal economy can you give us an idea of maybe how the reverse is possible where where the formal economy is learning from the illicit and the informal economies uh, both interesting questions so the first question was uh, can i comment on how uh, the emerging practice of micro-lending may talk about the intersection between the formal and, and the informal economy. Um, so micro-lending is, is the idea that small entrepreneurs can access financial markets through very small loans on the order of $100 to $1,000 that typically have a short period of maturation and the entrepreneur can pay it back fairly quickly. So Muhammad Yunus was the, I think he's Bangladeshi, was the economist who pioneered micro-lending through the Grameen Bank uh, back in the 1970s, and, and Eunice won the Nobel Prize for his work on this. Um, so this, this is an example, I would argue, of sort of the blend between the formal and the informal economy. If you think about my circles, that's one of the areas of overlap between the two. Um, there's also an emerging practice, uh, I don't think it's been called this, but it's, it's micro-insurance, uh, which is uh, oftentimes Poor individuals, not only can they not access financial services, but they can't access insurance. So there's been a growth in insurance cooperatives, local community-based insurance cooperatives around the world, so that the risk pool is much smaller. You know, in the United States, we have a risk pool of you know, 300 million. Uh, it might be 1,000 or so. Uh, and the principle is very much the same. The, 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 the practices are informal in the sense that in your insurance cooperative, um, in times of need, You'll, you'll get a payout, uh, and the expectation is when somebody else is in need, you'll con continue to contribute to the insurance pool. And it's not formalized in terms of policies and monthly deposits. Uh, it's kept uh, quite, quite uh, local and quite informal. 
And this really gets at the idea of uh, what social scientists call social capital. You know, financial capital is money. Um, social capital is trust. These are resources that are embedded in your relationships with others. And so social capital is a form of economic security. Um, I can turn to people I trust in moments of crisis. And so I think micro-lending and micro-insurance are both examples of that kind of social capital that, again, binds the informal and the informal economy uh, in some way. Um, and remind me, your second question was? It had to do with uh, how the formal economy um, institutions may be learning from practices from the, the informal and the economy. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, and so are there examples of formal enterprises that have learned from the informal economy and adopt, adopted some of those business practices? Um, although I'm hard pressed to think of specific examples, um, there, are, there is some evidence that formal firms are trying to access the informal economy. So Procter & Gamble, for example, a you know, large producer of consumer goods, you know, soaps, uh, shampoo, you know, all sorts of personal health care products. Um, Procter & Gamble had in, in Africa, in many of its African markets, has two competing lines. They've got the, the, the brand that they sell to the formal economy, and they've created a brand that they sell to the informal economy. Um, they've also started using uh, informal distribution channels by identifying local entrepreneurs, local shop owners, individual shop owners. This isn't a franchise distribution network individual shop owners, and P&G has tried to work with them to, to sell them, to distribute to them very small quantities for their communities. Uh, and in, in New Earth's book, P&G talks about how very lucrative these practices have been for them. So they are learning to access those markets, and I suspect they will start learning business practices in the other direction as well. I can visualize a upcoming crisis in America due to the increased demand of industry to require people that are highly educated and possibly technically capable. If we're producing an increasing number of labor-ready people through our education system, don't meet those requirements. A lot of those people will have to go to the informal industry. The demand of labor in the informal industry will begin to lessen, and those people will turn to crime, civil unrest. Um, any comment? That's a fascinating question. Uh, so. The observation is that we have a growing skills gap in our labor market where we have, we can project the amount of skilled labor we're creating through education and we can sort of forecast how much skilled labor we're creating and compare that to the needs of industry, technology, and innovation in the future. And I think you're quite right. There is evidence of an emerging skills gap and a shortfall in technical skilled professional labor in a number of industries. And you, you posit a scenario where this creates not only slowed innovation and slowed growth, but, but some of these uh, consequences in terms of turning to the illicit economy or the informal economy or, or even civil conflict. One, um, one interesting possibility, uh, I, I was actually talking to a, a, a colleague about this recently. I don't know if you're familiar with this website called Fiverr.com. It's F-I-V-E-R-R.com, double R. Uh, Fiverr is really a brokerage that puts buyers and sellers of services into contact with each other. And it's typically microservices. It's called Fiverr because any contract you sign is for $5. So um, a simple example, uh, my son and I are both big fans of The Simpsons. And so uh, a couple of years ago for Christmas, I wanted to get him a picture of himself drawn like a Simpsons character, right? sort of an animated version. So I went to Fiverr.com and I found an artist in India who was willing to do that, that image for me, and I paid him five bucks through Fiverr for this, for this wonderful image. 
All of this is to say there are emerging channels of labor employment that tap on skilled labor elsewhere in the world. Okay? Did I know that that artist was a talented, trained artist? No. Is it possible that American hospitals will contract with foreign radiologists to read x-rays? They're already doing it. Do those foreign hospitals know that those radiologists are appropriately trained and credentialed? They may or may not. All of this is to suggest that we may see the skilled labor gap filled by these informal networks of supply and demand. Now, that's not true of everything, uh, but there are arguably industries where skilled labor abroad can provide the service in ways that, again, we don't know if, we could, if, if the, the, the laborers and the providers are appropriately trained, licensed, credentialed, or insured. Um, so that, that's another possible scenario. Bitcoins fit into the formal or informal or illicit economy, and are they significant? Where do bitcoins fill into the informal, fit into the informal and informal economy, and are they significant? Um, to be honest with you, I don't know how large the global supply of bitcoins is, and of course, the I, I don't understand the technology. But I do understand, so Bitcoin is a digital currency. It's a store of wealth that isn't something you carry totems of. You don't have actual coins or dollars or bills or something that you carry. But it's a digital currency that's a store of wealth. And as I understand it, the technology limits the supply of Bitcoins to a predictable rate of growth. That predictable rate of growth is important to prevent inflation, right? So it's supposed to have a predictability as a store of wealth that's attractive to individuals. So because the supply grows at a fixed rate, as demand fluctuates, it can appreciate in value. So Bitcoin, I think, interfaces in one of two ways. First of all, it is a medium of exchange in the informal and illicit economy. So it's clear that lots of illicit service providers uh, will accept, if not request, payment in Bitcoins, so that Bitcoin effectively becomes a technology for laundering money. It becomes a way of taking cash from the formal economy, moving it to the illicit economy, and back. So that's one uh, form. But Bitcoin is also, uh, as a store of wealth, there's a speculative market in Bitcoins, just as there is in the stock market or in treasuries, where investors will buy Bitcoins betting that it will appreciate as an asset. So one of the interesting things we've seen in Bitcoin is there have actually been some financial crises in the Bitcoin world where the price has crashed as speculators have uh, reacted to different developments and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important source, source of money laundering. Uh, it's clear that some illicit activities have been, particularly uh, trafficking of narcotics, have been associated with Bitcoin. Um, but it's also a speculative market that I suspect becomes a place, you know, essentially, if I'm a holder of a lot of illicit cash, I can put it in bitcoins and it becomes, in a sense, a bank deposit for me. So it's a way of storing wealth. If I could, sir, um, as an example, I had a neighbor of mine, I had her computer uh, locked up with some ransomware, and the ransom that was demanded for release of her files was in bitcoins. That's, that's an interesting example. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, over here. to affect all the trade jobs in the uh, global economy. For instance, companies like iPhone that have the strategies of creating iPhone 6 in one month, in one year, another iPhone 7, and then there's this overly uh, continuous consuming and consuming. Do those really affect the economy or do they not affect the economy? And the other question is about the um, institutions like nonprofits that have monetized participation in those kind of soft skills. Do those ultimately harm the economy or do they create the alternative job opportunities that people can do besides having hard and skills? Yeah, both, both interesting questions. So the first question was about <coughs> consumer culture and how that may affect uh, the informal and illicit economy. So one clear way that 
consumer culture drives the informal economy is through counterfeiting. So um, uh, th there, there's a great example of this that I read about in the 1990s. Uh, I think it was 1990s, maybe early 2000s, uh, when cell phone technology in the early to mid 90s became uh, affordable for the masses. And suddenly everybody had a cell phone. And a cell phone became, in many places, a status symbol. So there was an anecdote about a, uh, a posh restaurant in, I think it was Rio de Janeiro, that was dealing with the annoyances of cell phones. This new technology was ringing, it was disturbing the dining experience. And so the restaurant insisted that patrons leave their cell phones at the hat check, and they could pick them up when they, when they left. After a couple of weeks, they discovered they had a large supply of unclaimed cell phones. And when they looked into it, they discovered that they weren't cell phones at all. They were, they were basically facsimiles. They were fakes, right? People were buying fakes because they were a status symbol, right? And they needed to convey that they had the wealth to afford a cell phone, which clearly they didn't. So consumer culture and fashion drives consumption choices such that people will buy cheap counterfeit goods, a Gucci bag, a cell phone, or, or, or something like that. So I think, I think that's the principal way that that uh, manifests in, in the illicit economy. Um, your second question was about NGOs and job creation, and whether or not this is really uh, socially beneficial, if I understood your question uh, correctly. Um, you know, my response is, I, I, I think it is socially beneficial. I mean, there are many uh, uh, places in the world where uh, the informal economy is people's only choice, their only source of economic productivity and wealth. Uh, and in fact, Robert Neuwirth, uh, again the author of the book Stealth of Nations, is actually very positive about the informal economy. He says that not only is it the, uh, the fastest growing sector of the global economy, that is most job creation is going on in the informal economy, but it's also increasingly a source of innovation. And he gives lots of interesting examples from, um, from um, Ciudad del Este in, in Paraguay, from Sao Paulo, from Lagos, where local entrepreneurs are really doing things that are solving social problems, providing potable drinking water, reliable electricity. Um, they're solving the problems that governments aren't. So his argument is the informal economy is actually quite beneficial. It's an employment uh, opportunity for many people. Uh, it's providing public goods and services that governments are failing to do. And it's growing faster than, than the formal economy. So um, while we attach the word informal and, and illicit to these with maybe some normative judgment. Um, I, I don't wish to judge. I simply wish to step back and say that these other sectors really complicate how we think about job creation. Over here and then back in the back. Yeah, I <coughs> Thank you for sharing your expertise. Would you comment please about the trillions of dollars it's well reputed, uh, primarily, I think, from Silicon Valley companies that are sitting outside the U.S. And if you agree it's desirable that it be repatriated, what would be your prescription for doing so? Thank you. The question is, uh, a number of very large American firms, particularly tech firms, have uh, assets or wealth or cash deposited outside the United States to the order of, of trillions of dollars. And the question is, uh, can we pre repatriate that money and is it desirable to repatriate that money? Um, because I'm not a financial economist, I'll qualify my remarks by saying this is just one guy's opinion. Um, you know, my sense is, my sense is it really doesn't matter. Uh, and. and the reason for, I mean, on the one hand, is the U.S. government losing tax revenue on that? Yes. Would it be nice if the U.S. government was able to effectively tax U.S. corporations? Yes. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, and this gets to one of the, again, one of the other misunderstandings about how multinational corporations work. Apple is a global corporation. It's got facilities all over the world. It employs people all over the world. But the truth is, most multinational corporations, like Apple, all of the high value activity that they do occurs in one country only. You know, for Apple, it's research and development and creation. Okay? Um, for banks, it's a lot of their financial services innovations. 
most of those high value activities occur in a single place. And that's true for most of these companies that have wealth deposited overseas. The, the global market for dollars is a very liquid and fluid market. Um, if Apple is depositing overseas, where it's deposited to me is immaterial because it's still wealth that is associated with a firm that's substantially an American firm. And it's ultimately used indirectly for productive purposes in our economy. First of all, uh, I'm a teacher uh, at a local high school here, so my, my question is kind of geared towards the uh, education. Um, I really love the, the metaphor of the garden, sort of tending to the garden, um, creating an environment for jobs. So uh, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were in terms of how the education system in a, in a country, in the world, um, but obviously specifically America, uh, how the education system sort of plays into creating that environment for job growth, um, and then sort of Ultimately, um, as an addition, um, healthcare um, and how that might go into creating that environment as well. So, I guess education, healthcare, and how they play a role in affecting uh, the growth of that garden. So, so. Sure. Uh, those are both uh, excellent questions. So, uh, how does the public, uh, I'll assume public education, but I'll talk about education writ large. How does education uh, facilitate these, culti cultivate these beneficial conditions for job growth? And likewise, how does the healthcare industry? Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, education uh, uh, briefly. Um, in, in addition to being a professor of political science and international studies, I'm the associate dean for the College of Arts and Letters. And the College of Arts and Letters is actually substantially a humanities and fine and performing arts college. Uh, so although I'm a social scientist, I've learned a lot about the fine and performing arts and the humanities. Uh, one of the interesting things that, we've, that I've learned in my job, and I think the university has found, is that when we talk to employers about the essential skills that they look for in employees, um, there seems to be a disparity between what employers want and what policymakers think they want. Policymakers put a lot of emphasis on STEM age, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and health. They want universities to produce graduates who have expertise in those areas. And those areas are important for innovation, there's no doubt about it. Um, but employers increasingly say, we want people with the creativity to solve difficult problems. You're not cultivating creative thinking, is what they tell us. And so in my hat as the associate dean, I say, the essential skills that we need to teach are not only science and math, but creative problem solving, and the humanities can help us with that. So uh, one of the things I think all of us at ODU in particular in my department, my graduate program, try to do, is we really engage in, in sort of these, these exercises to incul inculcate creative problem-solving skills. Uh, so I would say um, we need to, to break the rigor or the hegemony of specific disciplines uh, and encourage students to, um, to, to shed those paradigms and sort of think a little more creatively and integratively across paradigms. How you do that in terms of the classroom, you're probably more skilled to, to more qualified dancer than I am. Regarding health, I think health plays into job creation in a very important way. Um, and I, I preface my remarks by noting that our debate in the society about how to provide health care is a really profound and important one. It's one that is oftentimes characterized by some fairly strident language. And personally, I try to engage in a more civil discourse about policy choices. So I don't, I don't wish to be part of that strident uh, discourse. Uh, so without taking any position about what's the proper way, what I will say is people's uh, sense of their health care is very important to their economic security. If people are confident in the provision of their health care through whatever mechanism, through the state, through the market, through informal activities, if they're confident in their health care, they are less likely to migrate to the informal or the illicit economy. So um, my position is the growth of the informal and illicit economy is directly a consequence of the inability of the state to provide some basic social services for workers. That might be job retraining, it might be um, well-funded public pensions for retirement. Uh, it might be health care. It might be quality education. Uh, 
when governments provide those basic services, people are more comfortable and more secure in the formal economy. So I think that's how healthcare relates to that. Over here, please. Thank you. And again, thank you for coming this evening today. Uh, my question has to do with how governments uh, tax people. In the United States, we have a model where we have uh, a progressive income tax, but we also have uh, withholding taxes for Social Security, uh, and we also have a sales tax. But there are other nations that uh, use uh, basically a big sales tax, figuring that uh, uh, people may be able to get around the rules uh, for income tax, but ultimately they have to spend the money at the cash register, and that's where we'll catch them. So they use the value of added tax. Can you uh, give your thoughts about what system uh, would work better? So uh, which, which taxation system works better in the sort of uh, hybrid and arguably convoluted American taxation system? or a more traditional value-added taxation system? I think this is a, a very interesting question. And I, I must confess that the questions are, are if you're part of the pun, taxing my knowledge of economics. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of cautious in, in providing an answer. Um, and I, I would put forth in, in agreement with your question that the American system is actually even more convoluted than you characterize it, because in addition to this hybrid combination of income tax, consumption tax, withholdings, we also have differences between federal and state taxes. So uh, my college roommate uh, lives in Texas and, and pays no income tax to Texas, right? Because Texas doesn't have an income tax. So um, we have very, very complicated taxation rules here. And I think in principle, the more complicated the taxation system, the more of a drag it is on growth and job creation and so I think simplification would be conducive to job creation and growth. Politically, how we achieve that, I have no idea. Um, concerning the difference between that and a value-added tax, you know, the purpose of a value-added tax, of course, is to discourage consumption and encourage savings, right? Because uh, if you pay a tax only when you consume, a dollar saved is, is worth more than a dollar spent. So it incentivizes people to save money. And of course, saving money is useful because when you're saving money, there is money available for lending, for, uh, for uh, lending to companies to innovate, to expand, and to create jobs, and so on and so forth. So in principle, I think the value-added tax um, has that, that sort of job growth opportunity that, that would be beneficial. Uh, I, I do wonder, and I don't know, but I wonder whether a value-added tax would also have some unintended consequences in terms of spending in the informal economy uh, because it will shape your consumption choices, right? So if I pay a value-added tax and I want a TV, I could pay a 15% tax on that TV or I could go to the informal economy and not pay a tax at all. So it's possible that by taxing consumption, you change consumption patterns in a way that you're incentivizing the informal and the illicit economy. Now, I think that would be a fascinating economic study. I bet you somebody has done it, but I don't know. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hold on, we'll wait for the uh, microphone. Yes, I wonder if you can uh, uh, Washington State's uh, taxing uh, the value of tax and decreasing it on the gas and the gas pump. Thank you. So the question was, uh, Washington State has imposed a value-added tax on gasoline with the intent to incentivize consumers to uh, change their gasoline consumption habits, presumably switch to uh, cleaner burning, more efficient sources of fuel, and obviously more efficient sources of transportation. Did I understand the question correctly? Um, so 
Um, I, again, I don't know any of the specifics of how that is affecting uh, choices in um, in Washington State. Um, I do know that I'll use an economic term here. The marginal rate of consumption of gasoline um, is is uh, it, it's very inelastic. It's very price inelastic, which means um, to change a person's consumption habits, you have to have a drastic change in prices. A small change in price isn't going to change a person's consumption a whole lot. So that for, to incentivize people to stop using gas or stop driving cars, it's going to have to be a very, very large tax. Uh, so I don't know the specifics of their taxation rate and whether or not it actually achieves what it's seeking to do. Um, but again, I worry that um, it, it will have unintended consequences. Um, so uh, I think about, you know, the example, of course, is um, cigarettes. When governments increased the taxation rate on cigarettes in the mid-1990s, um, you know, a pack of cigarettes went from two bucks to six bucks or something like that. I mean, it was a 200% taxation rate. Um, the, the market for, um, uh, for uh, uh, not, uh, what's the term? contraband cigarettes explode. And so cigarette piracy just became a huge, huge industry because, you know, cigarettes are kind of like gas, right? You're addicted to it, your marginal rate of consumption, you know, it's very price inelastic. I'm not gonna give up smoking just because it costs me three times. So people started buying contraband cigarettes. So um, th this, this, is the, this is the real challenge. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to my original thesis, which is, Economists don't really understand how these things work, and that's a, that's a little bit of an oversimplification, because uh, there has been an emergence in the field of economics, a field called behavioral economics. Traditional American economics has really been based on this abstract model of the rational utility maximizer, the homo economicus, the person who makes perfect decisions about their consumption choices. Well, it turns out people aren't perfect in their decision making. Behavioral economics says, let's study people as they really are. Let's study people as addicted to smoking. Let's study people as addicted to their cars. And so the field of behavioral economics, I think, is coming a long ways towards understanding how these policy choices may or may not produce the consequences that we intend. So I, I, I think the field of economics is coming a long ways towards that. And I think in the, in the coming years, we'll have a much better understanding about how these policy choices, like uh, in Washington State, uh, may or may not achieve the outcome that we see. Yeah, and, and in fact, I haven't been following that particular debate. So the, so the question is, you know, given that this value-added tax is raising new revenues, those new revenues can be put towards more socially productive enterprises like more efficient transportation. Um, so so two, two quick thoughts I had in response to, to your observation. Um, one is, um, it, it's, it's a principle of regulation, and it's a principle of taxation, that regulations are never as effective and taxes are never as large as projections. Right? Because, because people learn. People learn and they change in ways to avoid taxation and avoid regulation. So it's beneficial, but it's never as beneficial as we anticipated it will be. Uh, and then the other, the other sort of thought I had was, people are really creative in circ circumventing regulations. And you know, you talked about people driving to Oregon to fill up their cars. Um, we've all seen border towns that are um, basically regulatory arbitrage, sales points of sale. So, uh, I, when I was going to Stanford, I, I lived in Colorado. I'd drive home from, Colorado, from California to Colorado every summer, uh, which is about a 1,200-mile drive. And I'd get to State Line, Nevada. State Line, Nevada is right on the border with Utah. Needless to say, there are a number of really nice casinos right on State Line, in State Line, Nevada, right? And I don't think they're catering to Nevadans. 
I think they're catering to Utah, right? So you can't gamble in Utah, but boy, you can get around that with a short drive to the port. Uh, so there are lots of, and, and again, that's an example of the market evolving in ways to circumvent regulation and taxation that, that undercuts the expect, expected public utility or public use of the regulation. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you for uh, coming out. Jefferson Cup, the sign of friendship. You might already have one from your last time out here. And, uh, and thanks for coming out on a beautiful day. And I hope you guys enjoy your beautiful day, too. And we'll see you next week to talk about China and the uh, South. Uh, yes, this is having trouble today. What are we talking about next week? South China Sea. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.